Thanks, Rob. I am your host, Morgan Hutchinson, and I'm here um, coming from the emergency department at Thomas Jefferson University. And I'm here joined with my whole team from the Health Design Lab. Misty Stein, Michelle Ho, Mary Ellen Daly, and of course, you know, our friendly producer and Zoom bouncer, Rob Puglisi, my co-host, Matt Fields, and our Design Lab Director, Bong Koop. We are also joined by our friends at Cooper Hewitt and the Smithsonian Museum, including designer, writer, and curator, Ellen Lupton. Please remember to turn on your video, use the chat box to introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about yourself, and of course, as always, feel free to join us in an optional happy hour drink. If you missed any of our prior episodes, you can check them out on healthdesignlab.com slash D-O-T-F-L. Nurses are truly frontline workers. Today, we are lucky to have two nurses here as speakers. We have Marian Leary, who's joining us from University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, and Ashley Howell, who is our colleague in the emergency department at Thomas Jefferson University. Following these two speakers, we have Brian Lee, who's an architect and designer coming from New Orleans. Each speaker has about five minutes to speak, and we will also have two five-minute breakout rooms for you. It's all you. <laughs> all right. So, um, you know, for, for those of us who have been working in emergency rooms and hospitals and taking care of patients, we know that uh, coronavirus has disproportionately uh, killed people of color in our country. Um, Black Americans are two times as likely to die from COVID-19 as white Americans in some areas of our country. It's even as high as three times. And the, the health disparities in COVID-19 are not due to uh, genetics, but rather uh, it's due to decades of uh, racist uh, policies in our country. Uh, racist policies have led to higher rates of chronic health conditions like asthma, COPD, diabetes, obesity, kidney disease in uh, communities of color. And unfortunately, these conditions are risk factors for COVID-19. So when we think about um, ending these health disparities in this current uh, pandemic, it's critical for us to keep in mind of, of designing for uh, social justice. We believe that racism is a public health emergency and designing solutions for uh, COVID-19, we need to keep aware and of these uh, issues and address the current racist uh, policies that exist. So it's been a tough week for us here in this country. Um, and uh, we are just kind of grateful that you're able to join us and um, want to kick it off to uh, Matt Field who will introduce our first guest. All right, thank you, Bon, um, and thank you for that. I am really excited to introduce someone I first crossed paths with probably 10 years ago at the University of Pennsylvania when she was doing some pioneering work in resuscitation. Since then, Marian Leary has become an all-star at the crossroad of nursing and innovation and she in design thinking. And she's the director of innovation for the School of Nursing. She's done some really cool stuff like founding Emerge Labs, which uses augmented and virtual reality platforms to reimagine how we prepare for emergencies. And in 2007, Marian Leary was named Philadelphia's Geek of the Year by Geekadelphia, Generosity, and technically PHL. And you know, when I was growing up being geek wasn't cool, but now it's like the best thing. It's the greatest title you can ever, you can ever get. So that's so awesome. She's also a host of steam rollers, a segment of the steam everyday podcast featuring women who are paving the way in science, technology, engineering, art, and math. So Marianne, it's awesome to have you here with us. Thanks for coming. Hey everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm going to just pull up my slides. Can you all see those? Great. Um, so Matt, thank you for introducing me. Um, being uh, 2017, Philadelphia's 2017 Geek of the Year was actually one of the best titles and uh, awards I will ever get. So um, thanks for mentioning that. Um, so like, um, like Matt said, I am the Director of Innovation at the University of Pennsylvania School of Nursing. I'm also a founding member of the Society of Nurse Scientists, Innovators, Entrepreneurs, and Leaders. And I bring that up because what I'm going to be briefly talking about today is the work that we did during um, COVID-19 around um, hacking for health. So two weekends ago, we led the Designing the Future Nurse Hack for Health Hackathon, um, looking at COVID-19. And um, we did this in partnership with Johnson & Johnson and Microsoft and DevUp. So um, the four uh, companies worked together on this weekend-long nurse-led hackathon. 
And the idea is that we wanted to have not just nurses, though, it was focused at for nurses, but we wanted to have engineers, designers, um, innovators, entrepreneurs, physicians, pharmacists, whoever was interested, um, come together for a weekend and create solutions to problems that our nurse clinicians were seeing on the front lines during this pandemic. And we had over 500 participants um, work through the weekend. We had thir over 30 teams um, create uh, pitch solutions at the end of that weekend in five different challenge areas. So we looked at remote patient monitoring in the acute care setting, um, remote patient monitoring in the home care setting, uh, patient transfer, handoff and huddle, data and reporting, and resiliency and self-care. And those were the five areas we really wanted the nurses to design innovative solutions around. Um, but we wanted to build a foundation for the nurses to understand how to get from a problem all the way through to a solution. And um, in partnership with IDEO, so we had two speakers um, from IDEO, which is a big design thinking firm, who did uh, lectures on the Wednesday before the hackathon and then during our Friday night virtual kickoff around using design thinking and innovation to respond to COVID-19. And this set the framework of design thinking going from empathy, define, ideate, prototype, and test. And then um, we also included a number of different resources for all of our um, participants around um, design thinking as well. So we really wanted to give them this foundation to use throughout the weekend. Um, and one of the um, resources that we gave them, so at Penn Nursing, we created the Design Thinking for Health platform, which is an open access uh, free curriculum that nurses can use to design solutions to problems they're seeing every day in their practice. And so we let them go onto this uh, website, go through the curriculum, um, Dr. Von Ku is one of the lecturers on this online open access platform. So we created um, four documentary videos, six uh, original lecture videos, and some podcasts. And we also have design thinking resources act activities. And these were all used during the virtual hackathon um, to allow these nurses to work through the human centered design process. And so I'm just gonna quickly walk through some of the examples of what our teams and participate, participants in the hackathon did um, using design thinking to help them get to their end solution. Um, so obviously first step in design thinking is empathy. And because this was a virtual hackathon, um, the nurses used a lot of social media to do interviews and um, to try and find key stakeholders to talk with and to learn about their experiences. Also, because we had over 500 participants, most of whom were clinicians, um, they were able to take the experience, the collective experience of the group and really take the observations um, from those colleagues to understand these different problems um, that they were trying to solve for. Some teams were looking at how to use school nurses for contact tracing. Uh, some teams were looking at how to decrease um, exposure to COVID-19 during acute um, incidences in the hospital. Some folks were trying to figure out how to keep morale and resiliency up in their colleagues and coworkers. And all this came out by talking and using the empathy activities and design thinking. Um, these two teams here use journey mapping, but a number of other resources and design thinking activities were used as well. Um, we had teams obviously then go through and define what their problems were. Um, again, I just mentioned some of those problems, so I won't belabor this section, but um, you know, there were a lot of um, teams working on different platforms to think about what the problem statements were, think about um, the problem from the point of view of the different stakeholders who they were designing for during this hackathon. And that could have been clinicians, but it also could have been patients, it could have been community members. Um, it really ran the, the, the gamut of this, the spectrum. Um, and then for ideation, um, you know, we had some of the teams that were using, you know, it's like, it's not like, I like down here, one of the teams was um, looking at if this may or may not age me, but the old uh, Microsoft Word paperclip that used to, pop up um, when Microsoft first came out, um, you know, looking at whatever that team was thinking of for a solution, was it like 
um, that Microsoft paperclip and how could they build on what was already existing and use it in a different way um, in the solution that they were um, creating. Um, we did have a number of teams create working prototypes. So the idea with this hackathon was really, we didn't want a hackathon for a hackathon's sake. We really wanted um, the teams and we stressed to the teams that the solutions that they came up with needed to get out to the clinicians as quickly as possible after the hackathon was over. And so um, these were tech-based solutions that we were asking teams to create. And also I failed to mention these were open access solutions. So whatever was designed during the hackathon um, is open source and was put on um, GitHub. So any healthcare system, provider, community group um, that has a need for these can go in there and um, grab the code and build upon it. Um, so we had teams again building out these prototypes over the weekend and also testing them. Um, so uh, I'll move back prototyping real quick. This team was looking at a um, patient augmented reality information system that um, you could use in the patient's room so you wouldn't have to bring different charts in or um, you know other um, uh, computers into the room that you could just see everything you needed to see using augmented reality. Um, additionally, we had a team who was looking at resiliency and built out an app that they tested over the weekend um, uh, as well. Um, and you know, part of design thinking is being able to storytell and to pitch your solution. And we did have a number, like I said, we had over 30 teams who were pitching to a number of different judges um, from around the world. We had um, judges who were physicians, designers, entrepreneurs, CIOs, CEOs. Um, uh, and so at the end of the weekend, folks pitched, we picked winners. These are our five winners from those five different areas. Um, and um, they're now gonna move on to get three months of mentorship from Microsoft, Johnson & Johnson, and SunCL to continue building out their solutions. Um, and again, these were focused on COVID-19 for clinicians um, at the bedside and out in the community to really help solve the problems that they're seeing during this pandemic. Uh, the hackathon was a huge success of all the surveys we got back. Um, the nurses were really excited to learn more about design thinking. Um, as somebody who's been working in this area for a couple years now, to really see design thinking come from sort of obscurity in nursing to where people in the profession are really looking for more resources and interaction with this methodology has been really great to see. Um, and this was definitely highlighted during this COVID-19 virtual hackathon. Um, if anybody's interested in seeing how the weekend played out, we put together a uh, transcript of the Twitter hashtag on Walklet that you can access here. And we also have the winning pitches. Um, we video recorded them all, so those uh, can be accessed through the Microsoft telecommunity as well. And with that, I will uh, wait for questions or see how this plays out. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome, Marian. Thank you so much. That was a great, great presentation and uh, perfect timing because I know that we were discussing strategies to approach a hackathon virtually and so glad to see that you have done it. And it sounds like it is a very viable thing to do. And I was actually, I'm getting, is, it, is there actually maybe even like advantages to doing it virtually that you didn't anticipate? Totally. It was so super successful. I've been on some virtual hackathons during the COVID-19 that weren't as successful. I'm not just saying that because I was involved with it, um, but um, there's definitely pluses and minuses. Pluses being that we had people from all over the world. I mean, this was a global hackathon who otherwise would not have been able to participate. And I think um, a lot of the nursing hackathons I've been to in the past were not as heavy on programmers and designers. Whereas this one, I think because it was virtual, the programmers and designers didn't have to leave their homes. Um, okay. We really had a lot more engagement from those professions as well. Um, so definitely pluses and minuses, all of our participants said they felt equally as engaged as if we had been there in person. Um, so I'd be happy to talk through Matt, how that worked, um, you know, at some point. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very interested. I'm sure a lot of other people will be too. Uh, well, thank you, Marian. Um, so that was excellent. I'm going to go ahead and kick it back over to Morgan because I think she's going to take us to some breakout rooms maybe. So go ahead, Morgan. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Marian. It is time for our first breakout room. So rules for the breakout room, we're going to randomly assign you all into groups of four to six people. This is a time for you all to connect and introduce yourself to each other. Tell us who you are, where you're from, what kind of work you do. And for our prompt for this breakout room, we're going to ask you, what has been your favorite way to stay connected? with your community during the COVID-19 pandemic. Hey, everybody. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to the breakout room. Hello. I'm Matt. Nice to meet you guys. Um, everybody want to introduce themselves? I can go. Uh, yeah. My name is Sai, and I'm calling in from Texas. I am a graduate human-centered designer, and I used to work as a UX researcher. Um, I am particularly interested in the healthcare field and uh, uh, I used to work at Rust Medical University as a design facilitator. Oh, cool. Well, Sai, what's up? I think we've been put in the same breakout room yes. multiple times for these. <laughs> exactly. I don't know if Rob keeps linking us. All right. Cool. Good to have you back. Uh, had, uh, Dina or uh, Jamie? Or Dina, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I'll jump in. Um, yeah. Dina Swinson, Washington, D.C. I'm an architect and designer. And I've actually, um, my specialty is uh, learning environments in schools. Um, oh, I cool. know of Bon Ku, of Bon's work through a friend, Matt Trowbridge, mm. um, who he's a pediatrician and another design thinking um, medical doctor who helped me design a school around childhood obesity. Oh. Um, so anyway, I wow. I know of all of your work in this community, and I'm kind of bombing in to learn from you guys how you innovate. So cool, awesome, well, welcome. That's uh, that's pretty awesome work you're doing. Uh, you know, to to design a school around childhood obesity. That's that's great. Like great idea. Oh my gosh, yeah, cool. Yeah. Thank you, Jamie. I love the, Hi, is it? Am I saying it right? Yeah, you are. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks. All right. <laughs> Yeah, it's a silent H in there. Yeah. Hi everyone, I'm Jamie. I'm a fourth year medical student at the University of Vermont. Um, I've been really interested in design thinking and trying to spread it to different medical students. And I recently bought this book. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. And, um, so I It's going to be so great that I'm recording. I'm, I'm actually recording. I'm the recorder. So it's going to be so great that that was recorded. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah, well, I'm really happy to connect to other people outside my school. Usually when I talk about design thinking in school, and there's like one or two of us that are like, yay, and everybody else is like, what? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So nice to find a community. Nice, thanks. And uh, Kim, I can, well, you're unmuted now, which is good. I, I don't see the mute thing, but can, I guess we still can't hear you. Uh, no, no audio? No, okay. Well, it's still very nice to meet you, Kim. Sorry. Okay. Nice to meet you, Kim. Um, I don't know if we have a chat window. You could use the chat. Cool. All right. Well, um, what was our topic to how to connect, how to stay connected in yeah. COVID? I think this is how I stay connected. <laughs> I was like, whatever the topic, I was like, uh, Zoom. Um, but, you know, it's been um, uh, the other, I mean, it's really interesting. One of the things that happened in our, our work group uh, was to create a, a, an account, just just a Slack account for our our yeah. group. And I, you know, I, I mean, we always use a lot of Slack for, for work. Health design will be used Slack, but to use it in a big faculty group, I didn't know. And uh, it's been actually really amazing how many uh, relationships have actually developed, um, I think, just by the ability to have uh, communication in that format of, almost like a text, but non-intrusive. Um, mm -hmm. Everybody can kind of turn on, jump in, jump out. Um, so that's been cool for us, yeah. Yeah, I can completely second that because my organization went to Slack also. And mm -hmm. it, it's so, it's like democratized um, communication, I feel. Like it's less formal oh, than I like that. Now, so I don't have to think about it. Um, it's on my phone, so I can be really accessible. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's been really well. I like want to transfer my parents onto Slack now too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cause it, it's interesting. Cause emails, if you send an email to our group, 
that's a big deal. It's yeah. like you're you're standing up and you're getting anybody's attention, but with Slack, it's you can be it's it's more water cooler, but it's something that everybody can hear, yeah. you know, um, if they want to. Um, <laughs> and the search yeah. function is amazing. Well, wait, what's the search function? Like you can search for conversations. Oh, search, oh, search. Oh, I yeah. said search. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, totally. And also, it's oh, it's it's probably the only uh, serv, like. Uh, what uh, a platform which is connected to Zoom, <laughs> yeah. which probably, the, I mean, the both of the stocks are even raising all the while just because of the COVID crisis. Zoom yeah. and Slack. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely think there's a learning curve with it. It's my only complaint um, because I think it's. Mm -hmm. There's but, no yeah, but yeah. welcome back, everybody. Oh, those breakout rooms go by so quickly. It's nice to meet everybody with Kathy and um, Ashlyn and Ram and everyone. And uh, we have people calling in from Chicago and from Arizona and I know from all over the world as well. Um, it's great to talk to you guys. So I'd like to go ahead and introduce our second speaker, Ashley Howell, who is a friend of ours and a colleague of ours. She is an emergency medicine nurse at Thomas Jefferson University where um, many of us in the health design lab also work. And then Ashley, I'll share, I think I'll share my screen, right? Okay, sounds good. Cool. Just have to figure that out. So I'll get started. Hi, I'm Ashley. I'm a registered nurse that works in emergency department along with Morgan, uh, Bon, and also Matt um, in the emergency room in Center City. Um, I've been at Jefferson for about a year now before I was at Hahnemann, which uh, was one of our other inner city hospitals that unfortunately closed down last year. Um, there I worked as an ICU nurse and now I am here working at Jeff with my new family and I am honored and proud to be here. Um, so this year has been a, has turned our world upside down, first starting with COVID-19. Um, I remember looking back, this is me actually guilt leaving out of a patient who we were treating for COVID-19 and basically give an example of how we um, have our pappers on and how we um, sterilize ourselves after we leave a room, make sure that we're thoroughly wiped down. Um, and I just posted this on my social media. Um, before we enter a room, we have to papper up, gown up. Um, make sure that we're changing our gloves, wearing our masks. Um, these are just a group of my colleagues and just amazing group of people that we've worked with um, throughout this crisis that has affected all of us worldwide. Um, either we know someone who has had it, we've had it ourselves, or we've taken care of it, um, of someone diagnosed, um, someone have, who has recovered from COVID-19 or has had, unfortunately not survived from COVID-19. Um, this has been a worldwide crisis. And I feel like as a nurse, not only as a nurse, but also an African-American nurse, I have another crisis that I'm also fighting for, which is obviously the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, this last week has been really hard, I think, for everyone. Um, not only including, you know, dealing with COVID-19 and like being on lockdown and not being connected to my family and friends, um, but also dealing with this and also understanding the movement um, and dealing with it firsthand. So I wanted to, felt that it was important this time to not only stand up and voice what I feel as a black um, African-American nurse um, and stand up for what is something that's also really important to me. And this is the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, Right here, I had so far attended three protests in Philadelphia. The first one I attended was Saturday, which I know we got slammed in the ED, so I've heard. Um, so I just wanted to share some pictures as far as how we've been as a community helping people and the protesters during this time as they're marching around Center City. Um, so to the left of you, um, there's two medics. Um, so in their bags, they had gloves, they had alcohol swabs, they had scissors, they had anything first aid that anyone would need just in case um, any of us got injured. Um, I also saw a number of people handing out milk, which is um, what protesters use whenever we are tear gas, pepper sprayed um, by police officers when they're 
attempting to de-escalate, which I feel that has been mostly peaceful protests, all the ones that I have attended and saw. Um, on the right side, I just had to take a picture of this young man who was walking with us. Um, and this was yesterday. He said, we are, I can't see the, it says, we are essential workers ending racism. Um, and this is what exactly is important to me. Um, like I said, I had posted a video on social media when I just was very compelled to feel like I needed to speak out, um, not only um, for my family, but also use my social media platform to um, be a voice to my community and also as a registered nurse on how we can help these people. And also wanting to show how um, the protests have been peaceful. Um, and ironically, as COVID-19 has affected us worldwide, I feel like this has also affected the whole entire world. It's been a ripple effect to see so many people of all walks of life, all religions um, come together as one. As you notice, like many people are wearing masks. I saw people handing out san hand sanitizers, gloves. We also were making sure that we were staying safe while we were protesting, which um, was extremely important. And um, I'm so glad that I was able to capture that, kept, uh, capture that on film. That video right there is actually more protesters that are joining um, the protest that I was in. They were actually coming up from, I believe, Broad Street. And uh, we just all started clapping once we saw them. Um, and right there at that location is Love Park that we are at. So this was me and to the right of me or my left uh, is my coworker. His name is Jackson. He is a daytime tech at the emergency room. Um, so that is the sign that is very true to me that I made before I went out on that protest. And it speaks from the heart. I am at the end of the day when I take off my scrubs, my stethoscope, clock out at the end of my shift, you know, I still I'm a black woman living in America. So um, this movement is something that um, affects me, my family, and is important to me. And at the end of the day, we are all coming together as one, fighting for humanity, um, human rights. And to see people from all walks of life is I've seen people protesting in Israel, Palestine, Italy, France, Jamaica, all the states have been participating, so it's amazing. To the left is another coworker, her name's Anna. She's an agency, she's also another emergency room nurse, and that was us protesting yesterday, walking to the art museum. Um, to the right, that was the first protest I went to, and I had took that picture. It's for, I believe that they're residents, I'm not sure where they um, are working, and I saw them, and as I was protesting, and, I was walking and I had to capture this picture because at the end of the day, as healthcare providers, as frontline workers, we are here to treat, we support each other, we want to provide service and aid to patients of all walks of life, sick, dying, healthy, rich, poor, doesn't matter. Um, so the fact that these four healthcare providers came out either beginning of the shift, after their shift, they felt that it was important to speak up and also take a stance of what they believe in because at the end of the day, it's humanity that we're standing up for it. Um, and, and sadly, it's not just one incident that happened last week with Mr. George Floyd. Unfortunately, it's um, a, can, a pattern that I've seen, um, a, unfortunately, a lot of times. Um, but I just had to take this picture and it just speaks volumes. And to see so many people get together during this crisis, um, during COVID-19, was just such an inspirational for me. Um, and I think I've tried to see the positivity throughout this. Um, so I think me going out to protest along with my coworkers has really helped me see the light in the community that we've all been gathering for and coming together to stand up for the rights of humanity. Thank you so much, Ashley. It's an honor to have you here. And thank you so much for sharing those photos and the experience that you've had and your perspective. It's very, um, very wonderful. Thank you. Let me see. And there's a, I, there's a, Morgan, there's a great question um, from Colleen. It says, um, oh. do, do you feel like, and so this is for Ashley, do you feel like racism is talked about in healthcare settings, especially from hospital leadership? 
from my own experience, I don't. Um, I don't believe it's talked about enough. Um, I will say from my own personal um, perspective, um, I know that something like this, is, as far as racism, can be uncomfortable for people to talk about and to have an open discussion because we have so many people that have um, different views. Um, like one of the things I had said um, on one of my videos is it's very hard to see another person's perspective, which is understandable when you don't live it every day. Um, I don't believe it's talked about enough in healthcare. Um, I hope that eventually we can talk about this more fluently um, and understand that there's many people that can agree to disagree on certain things. Um, but I feel like certain people may not may stay away from that subject because it makes them uncomfortable. Um, but I, I personally don't feel like it's talked about enough. Thank you, Ashley. Um, I'll turn it over to our director, Bon Koo, um, who will be introducing our next speaker. Yeah, I'm, um, thanks, Ashley. And i um, really honored to have Brian Lee here. I first met Brian at uh, South by Southwest or Actually, I don't think I met, well, I kind of met you. I was more just like in the audience <laughs> listening to you uh, speak about uh, design justice and it really, really blew me away. Um, uh, Brian Lee, he wrote an article called uh, American Cities Were Designed to Oppress and that's in City Lab. I'll share the link in the chat box. Uh, Brian is the, um, he's a designer. He's a director of uh, Collate Design and in 2018, Fast Company uh, voted him as one of the most creative people, which is pretty cool. But I've, I've been uh, a big fan because of his views on uh, design justice. And I think his message uh, is an important one during this time. And it applies not only to our current state in this country, but in healthcare as well. So um, thank you, Brian, for uh, joining us uh, this week. And um, I'll hand it over to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, I appreciate everybody having me today. You know, uh, it's been a long week. It's been a long month. It's been a long year, decade, century, uh, when you have to deal with uh, things that are so ingrained into the system that um, they they affect you at a cellular level, right? I know that's a, that's a metaphor. It's not a real thing. I know it's a bunch of doctors and nurses. So I know I'm not going <laughs> to... Don't fact check me on that, but 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 it is. It's a it's a deep uh, abiding thing that challenges and changes how we operate and, and move in the world. Uh, and so, you know, we abide by this core concept that for nearly every injustice in this world, there is an architecture that has been designed to sustain and perpetuate it. Right. This idea that uh, our values are validated in the spaces and places that we design and thusly uh, when uh, our neighborhoods are sick, our, our people become sick, right? Everyone knows this, right? Um, the sign that Ashley just showed, you know, uh, racism as a public health crisis is so uh, embedded, not just in, not just in the, the air in our cities, the, 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 the way in which we construct those places add to that, to that, uh, to that issue. Um, one of the things that often happens for us uh, when we are, are doing this work um, on a day in day out best is we, we, we talk about gentrification, we talk about um, its role in fragmenting communities and, and, and thusly uh, making those communities less likely to connect with one another, uh, less likely to be active outside of the home, less likely to uh, take care of, of each other, uh, and, 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 and then more likely to, to be sick because of it, right, in various ways. And so, um, so it's critical that we see this as both the acute and the obtuse kind of conditions that they are and address both with the same vigor. Um, you know, I've, uh, we, we, we often point to the fact that, um, you know, the, the, the issues that are harmful in our communities, uh, oftentimes the frontline workers uh, are, are the ones that, that have to deal with the, those, those kind of fires, whether small or large, you're dealing with something immediate. And it's why there are TV shows about cops and TV shows about doctors, because it's immediate. There aren't TV shows about architects because it takes us five years to do anything, right? Um, but 
uh, if you think about the, the destructiveness of, of certain acts, um, you know, the, the things that y'all deal with are the, again, these small fires, but think about architecture as, as kind of raging waters, right? Like it is, it is longer term it is omnipresent. It is, uh, still as destructive as, as anything else in this world. And, and, uh, we have to, to balance those elements enough to, uh, find some sort of, 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 of healing through that process. And so, um, so, so I will say, you know, uh, our work uh, in the last uh, month since we um, started to re-up our drive around Black Lives Matters in this last uh, series of protests has been to organize thousands of designers across the country uh, around uh, an action call. And that action call is to uh, dismantle the institutions and systems that maintain architecture and planning as a tool for that oppression. And uh, a way for us to do that uh, in, in is by, uh, in part, doing what BLM has asked us to, to kind of forward in this world, which is how do we defund police departments that usually eat up between 35 and 50% of our budgets uh, in cities and invest in uh, the cultural spaces and communities, the hospitals and clinics and communities, the, the, the things that actually secure and sustain um, community in a, in a real way. Uh, we talk about community and neighborhood as body and soul in a lot of ways. So neighborhood being the kind of geographic boundary that, that sustains a place or that, that gives you the meat of a place, but the community is the soul. It is this thing that has a uh, affinity to the body, but it's not conscribed to it. Uh, it can float outside. It can be it can be detached in some places, in some ways. And so we have to be very careful uh, to maintain that affinity as best we can. Um, and so our job uh, this last month is to to really uh, channel the thousands of people who have have joined this cause and uh, find ways to uh, address not just the uh, the murder of black people by way of state sanctioned violence, but the murder of black people by way of neglect. Uh, and that, that often happens in healthcare more than happens anywhere else. Uh, and so, um, you know, I, th I think about the mortality rates of, of black women. Uh, I think about the, um, the lack of concern uh, oftentimes for, um, you know, black and brown youth when they're trying to trying to to find healthy uh, alternatives in their lives. Um, and and I'm hoping that, you know, the connections that um, y'all have made and y'all are continuing to make uh, that I can join and that I can marshal, you know, the folks that we have to, to join in this fight and be supportive. Um, in the recovery of our immediate conditions, but I think long term, how can we can stay connected so that uh, the work that you're doing at the Design Lab is a part of what Design Justice does moving forward? Great. Uh, yeah. Th thanks, Brian. I think uh, we have maybe if, um, sometimes if you want to ask Brian some questions on the chat, I, I'd like to. Uh, I like this point about um, dismantling uh, institutions and. And I think really, and I saw some on the chat on the chat too that we talk about structural. Um, we talk about social determinants of health and how they impact um, overall health outcomes. But I think we have there's been a little discomfort of just calling out racism as 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 the cause of decades of of policies that have impacted uh, brown and black people in our country and have set up the conditions for communities of color to have worse health outcomes. And, and we know that place where you live is probably the most important factor in how, in how healthy you're gonna be because where you live determines how good your school district is, if you have access to food, if you have access to healthcare. Um, so I, I think um, the, there seems like there's a, a time now that we can just call it out for what it is. The, the decades of racist policy have impacted the health outcomes of of uh, of communities of color in in our, in our country. Um, any and I'm wondering, like, any advice to us in in the medical field of you know, what we can do to uh, address this? 
you know, the, the, the biggest thing that I could ask you to do is to marshal the weight of the medical field to pressure architecture, right? Like you, we uh, respect uh, the medical field. A, we know like what it takes to, to go through years and years of training and years and years of licensing to, to, to become uh, a person that could barely do the job that we thought we wanted to do. Like we're still always learning, right? And I think the medical profession can be more declarative about um, the social determinants of health in a way that starts to pinpoint how the architecture can start uh, causes a lot of these issues. Um, and, and I think it, in part it helps because, um, you know, we think about how zoning became established within the United States. We think about how redlining has impacted the distribution of resources uh, in the United States. Um, and all of those things start to chip away at the health of those communities. So marshalling the, the institutions within the AMA to, to be a sledgehammer against uh, other institutions that are not going to change otherwise. And there's, there's a question from uh, Ellen Lupton. She says, how will designers contribute to, contribute to dismantling the police system? Yeah, um, so the big things would be um, to, so the way that we think about the dismantling the police system is to uh, dismantle the parts of the institutions. So for instance, the AIA has a justice, um, justice track where they give honors and awards and they have a massive um, kind of uh, system to support that track. So detangling ourselves from that, detangling ourselves from the, the causes of SEPTED, which is crime prevention through environmental design. Um, one of the things that I wrote in the article is that, you know, uh, architecture ser serves as the, the uh, soft uh, power um, to police power, right? Like it is the warning shot uh, before, uh, before police are called. Um, and the way that we design spaces makes it intentionally uh, a warning shot. And so um, I think we, we should detangle uh, ourselves from the, the actions of defensible space and, and, and crime prevention through environmental design. And we should remove all officers and cops from uh, the design process completely. Like there's no reason a, <laughs> an officer should tell us what, what should be happening within the, the, the frame of a, uh, of a building. And, and we, there's um, it, there's some data I saw on, you know, we see these um, police in full on protective gear. And I think it's maybe about $800, $900 to outfit that riot police. And then there was a picture next of a healthcare worker and it's like eight bucks to uh, fund a healthcare worker. So I think uh, we talk about, um, when we talk about racist policies, we, then we have to think about how much in communities does that budget go to funding the police versus funding schools, uh, education for funding hospitals. And, and, you know, these are really kind of tangible ways of how we can kind of call out um, some of the racist policies around funding and yeah. overfunding of, of the police system and maybe underfunding of uh, education and, and health and, and workforce development in, in communities that have kind of created these uh, like conditions. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think lastly, before we, before I have to chew off, uh, <laughs> I just want to say, you know, again, I think about uh, how, um, you know, our, our policies are often centered on whiteness and they define like status quo by, by that definition. So we think about uh, single use zoning or single use uh, housing that uh, is proliferate across the United States is not necessarily a condition uh, that collective or cultural communities uh, want to endure. We actually enjoy congregating. It is part of our, our, of our very um, kind of essence. And so when we think about zoning policies uh, that, that detach us from one another, uh, it takes away from our psychological health, but ultimately it, it means that we have less interactions with one another, which means that it takes away from our physical health as well. And so we have to think about not just uh, the singular moments, but, but the collection of, of rules and policy that have, have been implemented over time that, uh, that culturally uh, define how we exist in this, this country, but are not necessarily uh, the way that um, uh, communities of color um, operate. All right. Uh, th th thanks, Brian. And I think we're going to, I'm going to kick it off to, is it Morgan or Matt? 
for yes, our next part? Okay. Thank great. you so much, Brian. We're very lucky to have you here. I really appreciate your um, perspective and your presentation just now. So we are now going to go into our second and final breakout room for the day. Just as a reminder, introduce yourself. Tell us where you're from. Tell us what you do. And for our prompt for this breakout room, it's going to be five minutes. What have you been doing to stay well during the COVID-19 pandemic? Hi. Hi, everybody. Hello. Hi, everybody. How are you? A few familiar faces. All right. Yes. I have one familiar. Well, I have two. <laughs> I can't. Yeah. Our, our, we're lucky to have one of our um, med students with us. We have a, a year four student here. Thank you. Thank you for joining. And you know, I think I'm becoming a regular here. Um, <laughs> That's great. I'm a fourth year medical student. I'm at Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia. Um, I'm also a design student, um, and I'm involved with Bob, too, who taught me pretty much everything I know about design thinking. Excited to be here. Awesome. How, how are you staying well, Lynn? Um, I go on walks with my mom. It's like, you know, getting back the family time that, you know, I didn't used to have being away at school. So it's been good in that good. sense. Yeah. Good. Awesome. Uh, Kuba, Kuba left, um, looks like, but yeah, I like her background. I love that. Yeah. I, lo I love her background. Oh, oh, I'm here. Here I'm here. Sorry. There you are. <laughs> Introduce, oh, um, cool. introduce yourself. Yes. Yeah. So my, sorry, I don't know what my name is not there. Um, I'm uh, Lucia Cuba. Um, Mary Ellen and I were in the previous um, oh, okay. Zoom room. Um, I am I am a designer uh, working at Parsons, the New School University. But my background is both in public health and and fashion design. So I was very interested about these conversations. Um, I'm not. I'm not fully sure how I have been uh, trying to to keep it together, <laughs> um, as we are all dealing with different uh, different different needs and issues. And yes, you can watch that. Sorry, I'm like with my kid right now. Like, oh, it's K I D S. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's 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 been quite a, a, a for sure a, a challenge to try to navigate around both university education and and school education and also the importance of keeping an active conversation about um, not just social determinants but social justice broadly uh, at at home as well and and outside. Yes, that's that, that's what I can say now because now I have to. Sorry, I have to. No, no, to nice to meet you. Nice, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Mary Ellen, what, is, what about, I'm, gonna, I'm going in order of people in my screen. So it's Mary Ellen, Juliet, and then Mary, so. Well, I've been staying well by staying away from the HDL faculty. <laughs> yeah, <I> <laughs> Only kidding, no. Um, <laughs> just, we've been working from home and, you know, just trying to limit my, my outside time to certain, certain hours of the day. I mean, I do have an underlying condition that makes me vulnerable, so I I try to stay away and just go out when I need to. And trying to stay healthy by uh, we we used to, when we first got married, my husband and I, we lived in one of my mother's apartments, and we had a, we built a gym in her basement. So I recently went down and dismantled it and brought it back home. So mm. we've been trying to stay healthy that way. <laughs> cool, yeah, a little home project activity. Julianne, yes. what, well, Julianne, introduce yourself. Hi everyone, I'm Julianne from San Francisco, California. Um, currently, I am in my application cycle for med school and also working at the ED um, as a scribe, so just like absorbing all the like different transitions and protocol I was making and stuff while trying to navigate um, the change dates of like the MCAT and applying and stuff. But also, I'm just trying to stay really involved with the intersection of design and healthcare. I think that's something I do want to go in. And right now, I'm just trying to just absorb all I can, learn all I can. And um, it's really exciting to see like that this intersection is like involved in really important conversations. It's great. To stay well. I am playing. I just try to play play my instruments, my piano when I can. Mm. Excellent. Awesome. Mary, uh, tell Hello. us about yourself. Hi, um, I can resonate with that, Julianne. I, I play the flute in the um, very poorly, um, the um, 
what is it called? Digitally do. <laughs> so <laughs> I bought one of those this, to kind of get the vibe and coming down. I am calling from Michigan. Um, I got acquainted with uh, Bunku um, in some of the writings and research. I live in Grand Rapids, Michigan and work for Spectrum Health Systems, which is the largest health systems in this area. And my work is in diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I work a lot with the clinical staff. I work across uh, a lot of different sectors in the organization to embed DEI. And we look at it, well, we have a, a, a design model we call inclusive design. Um, and so uh, that's what I do. And so I was having bandwidth problems because we had a wind that came through. So. I was on a call before here and it kept knocking me off and I tried to limit some of the bandwidth with the video. So didn't mean to be impolite. It was just, I kept getting bounced off all day and I didn't want that to be disruptive to the meeting. No worries. No worries. I had a power. It's been crazy. The storms and everything out here too. How, Mary, Mary, tell us, how do you, how do you stay well? Um, so the flute, um, breathing yeah. exercise, I actually am getting well. I had COVID. No um, way. Mid, yeah, mid of March. And um, fortunately, um, I think because I was on such a, I worked out a lot, um, mm. but I, I did gain the COVID-19 um, <laughs> and I, I probably about 19 pounds of weight, but it was, it was horrible. I'm just getting back to being able to breathe and I'm doing some breathing exercises. So that's why I've been playing the flute to help with that. Oh, gotcha. Well, I'm, you look well on the screen, Thank so I'm you. glad to say that. I'm glad. I thought I looked terrible because I was like, oh, I forgot I still had this bun up. <laughs> <laughs> no, you look good. Well, before nice we lose you. you. Wow, I had another great breakout room. I don't know about the rest of you guys. I think that we all did. But the interesting thing in my room is that I haven't had two people from the same place. It's so great to meet all of you guys from all over the world, all over the country, from all kinds of backgrounds and specialties. and careers and um it's just really nice to meet all of you and we've gotten great feedback from that hope you like the prompts feel free to send us ideas for next week and i think that we have a couple more questions we did get a lot of questions this week um for our speakers and we have a few more minutes so i will um along with matt and bond go ahead and ask a couple of those questions um bond did you have any of these that you want to start with Marion's hackathon, what are one of the great ideas that came up? So there were a ton of great ideas. It's hard to pick one. Um, I will say one of the ones that I thought would be most useful um, right now is um, it was looking at utilizing student nurses in public schools as contact tracers. So as schools are starting to try and figure out how they're possibly going to bring students back socially distancing and safe. Um, they also need to figure out how they're going to contact, trace, and monitor. And school nurse, nurses who are in, or students in nursing school, they have a lot of community clinical hours they need to do as well. And so somehow trying to, the idea was that they would use technology to match um, the nursing students with nursing schools and also then um, use sort of RFID tracking for contact tracing. I don't know exactly the details of it. I was not a judge on that one, um, but I thought that was really important because it is going to be, I think, something that is going to be um, at the forefront while schools start to think about reopening. And I'm going to post in the chat if anybody wants to watch the videos of the um, pitch, all of our teams pitched, um, you can go to our website and check those out. And there's a question from, uh, we probably have the last one, uh, Stesha. Um, for Brian, do you have any examples of ways we, we can repurpose already established buildings or maybe spaces to design spaces for justice? Sorry, on mute. Um, yeah, I think that the best way to think about that is uh, the amount of square footage that you have that's lost to uh, storefronts, um, to uh, ground level spaces. 
uh, I would say start there because those are the those are the spaces that actually start to c connect communities back together and start to weave uh, people back together. And so I'd say start there with civic, cultural, and communal opportunities uh, for people to gather uh, on a consistent basis, uh, whether that's to, to shop, to eat, to uh, love on one another. I mean, like whatever the thing is, we want to be able to, to enjoy the glow of our relationships uh, in, in those spaces. Thank you so much, Brian. It's great to hear from you. It's really great to hear from all of our speakers. Thank you, Marianne, Ashley, Brian. This has been an awesome week and a great conversation and two excellent breakout rooms. I would like to let you all know about our speakers for next week. We have Dr. Aditi Joshi, who's a director of Jeff Connect at Jefferson's Telehealth, Dr. Sheila Sani, who's an interventional cardiologist in New Jersey, and uh, one of the stars of Chasing the Cure with our own Bon Koo, and designer George I, who is the co-founder and director of innovation for the Greater Good Studio. It's going to be a great week, and we hope to see you guys all back there. We shall let you go, Rob. Go for it. Thank you. All right. Have a good one. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye. Thanks, Thanks Ashley. Everyone. Bye. Thank you.